Henry Ford said that history was bunk, and Napoleon said that history was the only true psychology and the only true philosophy. I think we can all realize that if we got the wrong history and been given the wrong information, it is bunk. So Henry Ford was mostly right, I'm afraid. But Napoleon had a very important point about it being the only true uh, philosophy and the only true psychology. And we all know how convoluted philosophy becomes. So maybe we can learn from the past. And this talk is to put the big perspective, the big picture in place. My work centers on uh, the incredible research of Christian and Barbara Joy O'Brien. Uh, and um, they have, if you like, provided the roadmap of time for me to fill in the gaps. And I continue with Christian O'Brien and Barbara Joy O'Brien's research. This is the book, The Genius of the Few, um, and their discovery of the Garden of Eden site, which was called Karsag by the Sumerians, uh, written up in great detail. Uh, this is their book called The Shining Ones, uh, which gives us the, uh, if you like, a masterwork of all their research carried out over their uh, lifetimes, in particular during the last 30 years of Christian O'Brien's uh, life. He retired from the oil industry in 1971. His, one of his most interesting discoveries is this island of Atlantis, but he was one of the world's great exploration geologists. He was responsible for rewriting geology books. Uh, he went out to um, the area of uh, the Mesopotamian Plains in 1936 as a young geologist from Cambridge to work uh, as an uh, exploration geologist and surveyor. And this discovery and, and putting it all together in 1984 of the Azores as the site of a large mid-Atlantic ridge island um, is there on the website which is uh, referred to in the comments I'm doing here goldenageproject.org.uk and it's named for that specific purpose that we're looking for the golden age which uh, is reported from our ancestors. The primary sources are the genius of the few a book called The Path of Light one of the most important references is a book written by the Reverend R. W. Morgan in 1860 called St. Paul in Britain. It does give the most marvelous information on how important the Druid culture was and very much more uh, not a religion but a way of doing things. Lawrence Gardner's uh, work also contributes to my overall story. He's done probably, I believe, the best researcher in the world on everything to do with religion and the history of religion. Uh, this is another book just come out by Philip Blair, who was the brother of Nigel Blair, who I worked with for four years until he died two years ago. And Philip Blair is another doctor of divinity and a professor um, at the Balaman University in the Lebanon, and I hope his department or the archaeological department will be uh, doing some work on the Garden of Eden site. This particular quote is a favorite of Barbara Joy O'Brien's, and it starts her chapter in the book, The Genius of the Few, on what she calls the unity of truth, to see that all religions, all beliefs, all have the same basic message, in, in fact, go back to an original benevolent source. The word Quran, um, Q-U-A, there's many, several spellings of it, but my, uh, my research tells me that that means, that translates as the readings and recitations of An. And we're going to see more about the Sumerian god An and the Akkadian god Anu being the same people and the importance of that particular individual amongst all groups all around the planet, particularly African tribes, North American tribes. Uh, he was the uh, single god who everybody related to and referred to. And so we had a monotheistic system right from the start. It wasn't something new. And if you have a real live flesh and blood God, what does he do? He has children and that's how you have this proliferation of generations of gods which has got everybody so desperately confused. So we're going back to basics. What we're talking about here is survivors from global catastrophe arriving in southern Lebanon circa 9,500 BC to restart agriculture and civilization at a place called Karsag, or Eden, later named as the Garden of Eden, led by An and Enil, or Enlil. Together with seven archangels, led by Gabriel, 
uh, and her name comes through as Ninka Sag, uh, Earth Mother, uh, Mother Hubbard, all sorts of names link into that. Those three form a triad, principally because Enil, um, wife, is Gabriel or Ninka Sag. So Gabriel was a woman rather than a man, which is quite an interesting point from the point of view of history. And Gabriel didn't necessarily mean a name at all. It was meant governor. She was governor of Karsag. And many of the names we're looking at here are names of uh, people within a role society. They're joined by the watchers, who were the first order of craftsmen, as they're described, who are also teachers and craftsmen. And subsequent generations are known as the people of the god Anne. For example, Tuatha de Nan means the people of the god Anne. And the Druids are also referred to as the people of the god Anne. Uh, and they're seen as simply a development of the people of the god Anne. They arrive um, in Britain around about 4000 BC, which is accepted by Colin Renfrew and all the conventional archaeologists as the start of agriculture, mixed farming in Britain um, from the Near East. Almost certainly, principally by boat. They set up the golden age of the city-states under the divine laws of Anne and Enil, who are described also as the immortal gods. Enoch, on being summoned by Anne, is taken by two angels and visits the planted highlands. So we have this word heaven, which O'Brien translates and makes much more sense, the word Hashemin with the root in the middle of that word, Shem, meaning planted highlands, as opposed to some kind of nebulous place in the sky. To record the detail of what was going on, he was asked to write down everything in the language we believe it was called Emi An, the language of heaven. They had their own internal uh, administrative uh, speedy writing, which Enoch refers to, and that uh, same in-house uh, writing, which if in effect is what we call the Phoenician alphabet, was in place from the very earliest of times, and we even find the Druids still in-house using that particular writing and language, but I will come on to that later. In the Bruce Codex, which is very important, probably the most important, along with the Askew Codex, source documents of what Jesus is actually teaching to his inner circle of disciples, and the translation of that is in the back of the room uh, in that book called The Path of Light. Jesus actually refers to being, a, being in the building of knowledge when Enoch was there. In other words, when Enoch went to record all that was going on, Jesus refers to being there. And Muhammad also describes a similar visit. We won't go into the detail of what's actually happening here, whether it's reincarnation or whatever else, but it's very important that within the records those two facts are accepted. Now, the philosophy and practice of the Golden Age equates, as near as we can, to the Abrahamic faith and is contained within the archaic, the oldest Sumerian records from which the Christian, Hebrew, Islamic, Vedic and other records eventually evolved. These three later points are I'm going to deal with tomorrow, but they are these. Rome was not the founding seat of the Christian faith. The movement began in Britain notably Glastonbury, amongst the Silurian people of the southwest, some while before St. Paul went to Rome. Baronius, the uh, great uh, Vatican historian, actually puts the date at AD 37. So the Vatican's own top man confirms that particular point. Um, Emperor Constantine proclaimed Christianity as the state religion of Rome because he had been born, raised, and lived until his imperial appointment as a Christian in York, where his father, Constantinius, had married Helen, um, or Elaine, who was the daughter of our famous old King Cole. Just before his death, he received an Arian Christian bishop, and there was no difference between the Arian Christians and the British Christians, um, and the style of Christianity uh, that he had encountered in Britain. What Augustine brought from Rome to England in AD 597, much later, was not Christianity, as commonly taught, but Catholicism. 
The word holistic, just to remind everybody what it means, it is the whole view, the overall view. It's about this multidisciplinary approach to history and to knowledge and to making sense of just about everything. We have to look at the big picture and have to go right round the subject and be very thorough and always have doubt in our minds until we can be as sure of certain issues as we are sure of ourselves, as Descartes described it. So let's just look and see where are we. Let's look at the big picture. And this is rather like going anywhere and being lost. Uh, what we have to do is be able to find out where we are. That's where we are. And as you can see here, we are there. Our sun is, is going, our planetary system is in the Milky Way, and it's traveling around. And that's a wonderful artist, artist impression of what our particular galaxy looks like amongst all the other galaxies in this massive universe. One of the most interesting aspects of science, which uh, was being discussed at Fitzwilliam College in Cambridge about two months ago, was that the physics of how our universe works tells us that there is a means, a mechanical means, of instant communication across the universe, which gives us clues to the fact that our universe might be as intelligent as our body is in dealing with all the problems that it deals with totally automatically without us having to deal with it. So we live in an, in, in an intelligent and responsive universe. So an instant means of communication. Normally we think of communication as being limited by the speed of light. But the way the physical makeup of, of, of what is now called plasma, electrons and neutrons, and an electrical um, magnetic uh, universe, our scientists tell us that we can, uh, they can understand that there is an a, 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 a instant method of communication. Now, I won't go into what that instant method of communication is, but it's rather like having a thought here, and that thought will be across the universe almost instantly. So that's science, yes, that science is now, be, now being talked about. This is how far we seem to have got in the last 50 years about what's going on out here. So what our sun is doing, the sun jumps and dives through the mid-plane of the galaxy. And this particular um, uh, um, picture shows a very interesting point. There are weaker cosmic rays, the Earth is warmer, and stronger cosmic rays, the Earth is cooler. And so we have a factor here that cosmic rays have a very major impact on us and our lives and our weather and our history. And if we're bathed in a great big blast of cosmic rays, the Earth can freeze over. So many clouds that it turns into what's called snowball Earth. And as we are at the moment with the terrific activity on the sun, then the cosmic rays are not getting through to create the low-level clouds over our oceans. And that is one of the main regulators, or second largest or important regulator of the climate. This is... Um, the kind of conditions which would have drenched the Earth with enough cosmic rays to make it freeze over. And here we have this extraordinary image here of the sun showing the eruptions from the surface of the sun. The solar wind which goes right out beyond our planets and if we look at any comet or any debris coming into our solar system, remember that the tail of the comet or debris is going away from the sun. And we're demonstrating the power and effect of that solar wind. And um, we're talking here about the magnetic, uh, and you can see the magnetic influences in these explosions or eruptions on the sun's surface. And the Earth is protected by its magnetic field. We're protected from cosmic rays from the sun's magnetic field, but we have this extraordinary situation where the Earth. Uh, climate is very tightly controlled and regulated, it doesn't vary very much, and the, the protection afforded by the magnetic element here is absolutely crucial. This is a, a little quote here, the sun puts out the same amount of energy in 25 millionths of a second as mankind has done over his entire 100,000 years of existence, from the first campfires to the Industrial Revolution. At the annual meeting of the professors of Bradford University last week, a leading professor of applied mathematics and a world authority on solar physics stated that a large body of suppressed scientific evidence shows that 
several of the other planets in the solar system, including the gas giant Jupiter, uh, are warming at almost exactly the same relative rate as Earth. It's not unreasonable to suggest that the sun may be driving this, rather than thinking that man has any real impact on our climate. The Little Ice Age coincided directly with the Maunder minimum when the sun was very inactive for 200 years. Now the sun has entered a period of higher activity than any in the last 400 million years, and other scientists connected with the same subject will tell you that that peak is occurring in 2012. So the story surrounding 2012 is in a peak of solar activity because the ancients had sufficient knowledge and followed sunspots and knew that we were likely to have a cyclical peak at that particular point in time. It doesn't necessarily mean we're all going to fry or things will get really serious. Now we look at the planets and the stars. This is about stars and stones. Here are some stars for you and the planets. And you'll see here we have um, the, you can see the light coming in on one side of these objects. And I mention this because what happened in 39,000 BC was a massive explosion in our solar system, a supernova explosion. That supernova was two, over 200 light years away. And it would have, the flash um, would have been so bright and so intense that it would have destroyed, or did destroy, certainly all the large animals and anything out in the open at that date of 39,000 BC. This is why we find one part of the planet, one half of the planet, centering on Australia and Indonesia, with an absence of any large mammals, for example, after that particular date of 39,000 BC. This is interesting because we've uh, had a, a conference in America two months ago um, who accepted the concept put forward by Richard Firestone, Alan West, and Simon Warwick Smith in the cycle of cosmic catastrophes that we have this supernova explosion which has an extraordinary impact in terms of our history and what's been happening to our planet over this period of time. And that coincides with the, the life of Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and uh, although it doesn't go back to 100,000 BC, we're looking at the fact that we are very recent species. So the first thing that happens is terrific explosion. Uh, what pump half of the Earth scorched and then 7,000 years later, because it's so far away, we then get a shell of debris um, or a shock wave from the same uh, explosion. And then third, which was about 12,000 BC, after the second event at the end of the Ice Age, we then get the big lumps of rock and debris uh, coming into our system. Now, this was the same for everybody all around the universe, everybody in the Milky Way. This was a major catastrophe within but no, the... Um, our um, own galaxy and within the whole universe as a whole. So we look at the situation where something major happened at the end of the Ice Age and we're now beginning to see what that was. That's us back to base and you can see this wonderful image of NASA and if you can visualize one part, the part of the Earth while we were rotating and we're traveling at 66,660 miles an hour, we're told, through space. Um, and one part of the rotation flash and, and damage and destruction. And we've got um, footprints of this cometary debris in the Carolina Bays in America. It's Dismal Bay in the Carolina Bays. And we've got this terrific amount of heavy metals in this area here, which give us the clues and dates of... Uh, a, a multiple object is believed, or are they talking of a single one of those multiple objects being 10 kilometers wide, crashing into the ice at a low trajectory over the North Pole and tipping the Earth on its axis. This gives a very good practical explanation of uh, the big flood, the great flood, the great catastrophe. And within 17 or 18 of the tribal histories in North America and South America and the area of the Gulf of Mexico, we have the story, and I'm only going to read the bold print, uh, the creator God appearing to the people saying one day, uh, go dig a large pit, cover it with logs and pile sand on the top 
and after it is done, seal yourself up inside the pit for protection. First of all, there was a creator god around, somebody clever enough to tell them to take cover and knew what was going to happen. And this, remember, is about 12,500 BC. And the story is common everywhere. Some animals and a few other people survived to rebuild the world. That is a, a structure where we actually have evidence of that type of structure being built at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Right about 9,500 BC it's been dated uh, from the occupation, but it may well have been much earlier. And we see these massive roof supports right the way through here being excavated, which would have been covered with a very, very solid timber roof um, and loads of earth on top of that to provide uh, somewhere dry, you can see it's up on the side of the hill, somewhere where people could have gone to hide or get under cover from the kind of problems that were created by the uh, debris and uh, destruction uh, which was described and forecasted by their gods. This is a um, clip from John Gagnon's latest book which is um, called The Great Pyramid Speaks, which is um, right sharp end knowledge, very important, very interesting. And much of the work here is being confirmed and backed up and supported because nobody likes to put information out until they can get the academics and the professional historians, if you like, to verify it or confirm it. But here you have a situation whereby the earth being hit in this direction here you would see what happened was that the ice cap would have moved south, hence the rapid melting. Your mammoths here in Siberia, um, out of the area of the first impact, the large mammoths in this area here, suddenly in grazing on steppe vegetation, would suddenly find themselves into an area which was freezing cold. That's why we have so many much evidence of mammoths being frozen solid with the grass still in their mouths at that particular time. Many, many other pieces of information uh, which are associated with the terrific movement of waters around the planet, the complete tipping and disruption of the seas, washing across America, um, and uh, all the evidence of caves uh, in the direction or line of flood, if you like, from these events being filled with debris. Um, and it's analyzing all the sites around the world where this kind of debris and the dating of that debris, we can build a picture of the actual structure of this great flood, great catastrophe for which there were very few survivors. Now, the staggering importance of this ties in with the Great Pyramid. Um, although I'll deal with an Enoch first. We have this wonderful records called the Books of Enoch, the Secrets of Enoch. They were all part of our church records. They were considered to be extremely important and included from the early times in what was called the canon, the church canon. But they were removed by St. Jerome in 390 AD, uh, about 60 years after Rome had taken over the job of running Christianity. And so it's very sad that Enoch's books were removed and are still not regarded as important by the Church of Rome because they were a marvelous history book. And Enoch actually says in one Enoch uh, that the earth tilting on its axis during which the earth labors and is violently shaken. And this event led to the largest mass, mass extinctions for three and a half million years. And whether it's Noah's flood or not is, is something which we can debate. It looks as though we had quite a lot of floods, but this is the big flood. We think of Noah's flood as a big flood, but Noah's flood was probably a smaller flood at a later time, and I'll come to that later. But this was the big flood, and the eventual demise of a large island on the site of the Azores. With the earth moving on its axis, we see cracks opening up, and you can see those cracks opening up in the Rift Valley, which runs from Turkey right the way down into Malawi. You can see the East Azores fault zone, which we're going to look at in a minute, large cracks opening up in the earth which are all recent and can be dated to this particular incident. But the Great Pyramid reflects the dimensions of the earth, the northern hemisphere in particular, and the star shafts which run from the king's chamber actually align with the stars Zeta Orionis and Alpha Draconis. And the suggestion here 
Um, and obviously more work needs to be done. This is one man's marvelous research. We're looking at the Queen's Chamber shafts pointing to where those stars were before the Earth tilted on its axis. Now, long-term geologists will tell you the Earth's been buffeted and bumped around for millions of years. And so we've got a, a, a something here which is very important because along with all the other high technology, we look as though we're looking at an advanced civilization which has left uh, encoded in the Great Pyramid um, the memory of that fearful event which would have, as I say, killed virtually everybody on the planet. The biggest mass extinction for three and a half million years at the end of the Ice Age. This is the um, area of the Azores. It's a flood basalt construction. Um, there's a whole series of information on this on the Golden Age Project website. And you'll see something that looks like a crater. Uh, it was what's called a hot spot, and it was flood basalt. And this is a, a massive construction all the way up the mid Well, this particular area of the Azores is a massive construction, the highest part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And you can see here this fracture zone here. There's a fracture zone which runs called the Krakow fracture zone there and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge down through here. And um, we're going to just show the picture of the Azores from the latest undersea leveling taken by Cardiff University and see that we can actually create, just simply by um, lifting it up and down, we can show an island exactly as described, not by, only by Plato, but many, many other individual historians independently and within all the, uh, the memories, tribal memories of people on both sides of Atlantic. That's a picture of uh, a comet, and that's supposed to be coming near the Earth in about 2016. That's a lovely image of a tsunami, and these are the kind of problems that we would have faced with very large areas of land being inundated. And we had a tsunami in 487, which um, would have destroyed most life um, and it, around the, well, below the 70-metre 70, 70 contour of Britain. Um, we don't know how high it was, but we find the evidence of destruction and so there was an enormous incentive for people not to build uh, their farms and their homes anywhere near the sea. They would have been up on the high ground. And that's why we find um, almost exclusively around the world people using the high areas to farm, to live, to build, along with all the other practical reasons of uh, dry ground. And in Britain, the time of Stonehenge, we were two degrees warmer, twice the rainfall, and therefore that land then, which would have had a foot more of topsoil than it's got on it now, would have been an ideal farming area and would have been easily cleared and would have probably been, been cleared uh, two or three thousand years earlier than Stonehenge was actually built. Although there is an original structure at Stonehenge dated at 8,700 BC uh, posts, which would suggest that that site was chosen much, much earlier for our ancestors to provide station stones in order to be able to make very accurate calculations uh, on the position of the earth in relation to it having moved on its axis. And so a great deal of recalculation had to be done by the ancient uh, surveyors and, uh, and astronomers. This is a wonderful picture, uh, the whole series of them done by a, a Frenchman called Herge for National Geographic based on all the archaeological knowledge that was being produced from Mesopotamia in the 1920s and 30s. And this, this quote is from the Epic of Gilgamesh. And I looked at the weather, stillness had set in, and all mankind had turned to clay. And between the two figures, you can see a cube, which is uh, the ark. The ark was supposed to be a cube. It's, it's, it's been called a cube, a ship, animals going two by two. But from the uh, more recent research uh, and the logic of what I'm saying, you will see that that was almost certainly uh, like the Ark of a Covenant. It was a, a large box which contained um, all the scientific tools um, and genetic material to restart life. Um, uh, um, that's what you would expect an advanced civilization to be able to do, and that's what you would expect us to be able to do if we were faced with the same problem today. And also here we have a flood story 
uh, in the third millennium in Samaria. So you'll find that all our biblical records uh, come from, uh, much of them comes from that time when the Israelites were in Samaria. Um, and when they, it was, sorry, they were exiled in Babylonia, which was the remains of Samaria. And the Enuma Elish, um, which is the creation story um, of the Sumerians, is almost word for word, line for line, the same as the early chapters in Genesis. So we're looking at Hebrew records being put together from material from earlier Samaria, much earlier, two, three, four thousand years earlier, and Egypt and other parts of the world, and also from Canaan, because the land of Canaan was far more sophisticated than Egypt or Mesopotamia at a much earlier date, and we're going to see how as we go along. Just bringing into modern knowledge about genetics and agriculture, because farming was absolutely crucial, and producing food was absolutely crucial, and it's even more crucial now with the prospect of an increase from 6 billion people on the planet to 9 billion people on the planet over the next 50 years, we're told. Now, these three boys, and it applies to everybody on our planet, including Aborigines, Pygmies, you name it, uh, share a common ancestor through the Y chromosome, male ancestor, at about 50,000 BC. Fact of life. That should open a few eyes for people who think we're all different when, in fact, we're all so much the same, so recent, so closely related. And remember that we all have different skills and abilities, whatever our color, whatever we are, whoever we are, it's finding what our special skills are that we should be looking at and not making judgments or measurements on preconceived ideas. This is a slide from Professor Daniel Zokri, who was the world's leading agriculturalist at the Jerusalem University. And although it's 93-94 um, time, it makes this point that if we look for the oldest seeds, and we can date seeds to plus or minus eight years, if we look for where those early seeds come from, and the original uh, crop assemblage with einhorn wheat, emma wheat, barley, chickpea, flax, um, vetches, uh, ordinary peas, we find that they all center in this area around Tel Aswad, which is very close to Damascus. A chickpea down here and the chickpea up here. And there was a marvelous report not long ago, about four or five weeks ago, um, on the chickpea being such a special product. It's almost unbelievable how good it is for us to eat that. Uh, and the idea that it occurred naturally is something we're going to look at next. The molecular genetic evidence for the spread of farming in Europe comes from a similar paper uh, on the same conference, and we find that we can take all the evidence for the spread of farming in Europe back to the site in the Near East. Colin Renfrew, um, has put the, the language families and spread of farming also to the same area, but he didn't join them up. And maybe 10 years ago, he was justified for not being too adventurous. But now, where people believe that farming and early peoples came from Altai and from this region of Siberia, for a whole number of reasons now, they realize that the restart must have taken place in this area here, this nuclear zone, as we call it, or more explicitly, a glacial refuge of all the important plants from which agriculture was created. The spread of agriculture from the Near East, this is the latest consensus, that it started here and went by ship largely and reaching places like side fields in the west coast of Ireland around about 4,000 B.C., and so we get this introduction of agriculture and very clever people and quite different people at that time. Then, in the same way that we've kept discovering more older and older civilizations uh, over the past thousand years, we're now looking at the discovery of this great archaic uh, civilization in the Golden Age, which was spawned by earlier and earlier or earlier civilizations. A little bit of agricultural science. Early forms of emma and einhorn wheat. The miracle of wheat begins with wild emma and einhorn, early grains that have tough, small tough seeds that cannot be effectively processed for food or easily digested by humans. 
Yet somehow Stone Age farmers grasped that if they kept harvesting and culling and replanting the largest of these useless seeds, eventually they would produce softer seeds that could be harvested, processed, and digested by a progeny of dozens of generations removed from them. Such a high level of selfless dedication to the future is clearly not possible today, so it seems unlikely, equally unlikely, 10,000 years ago. And our domesticated seeds are quite different from our wild seeds. We want the domesticated seeds to hold on so they can be thrashed and carried from the fields. The wild seeds naturally flutter to the ground. You want even germination, because you're so crucial when you plant a crop. And also all the spiky bits and horns on the wild plants uh, so that animals and birds and the wind can blow them around, whereas if we're farming, we want to collect them and we want to put them in the ground at precisely the right time, at the right depth and the right moisture conditions. We're led to believe that corn, uh, maize this is, came from this particular plant. And it's the same story here, um, that it's so different to the original native plant that it can only have been created by advanced knowledge and, dare I use the word, um, very clever genetic modification. We had two of the world's most famous botanists, uh, Bottomar and Zeist, Dutchman, um, and they, in a core sample, a sediment core sample from a lake, just over the mountain from Mount Hermon, where we're going soon, they found maize pollen, and they dated it at 7,500 BC. And the establishment said, oh, that's impossible, maize comes from America, go away and uh, you're sacked. We're not going to give you any more work to do. It wasn't quite like that, but it's the kind of reaction you get if you challenge the academic establishment, what I call scientific dogma. And remember, that this lecture is going to be dealing with religious doc dogma, scientific dogma, and we may even touch on political dogma. And they are the big bugbears of uh, having a, a peaceful world and a better organized world. Same with domesticated animals. This is the wild boar tooth and the domesticated pig. And here one can say, here also the effects of domestication on wild animals is abundantly clear. The tooth of the wild pig above is three times larger than the same tooth in the domesticated pig. Yet we are asked to accept and believe that Stone Age people will be willing to endure generations of living cheek by jar with ill-tempered, heavily horned, wild sheep, cattle, and raise the dark, sharp tusks of pigs so that their distinctly uh, removed progeny could enjoy the benefit of their labors. You can see the logic here, um, and it may be hard to accept, but it's gradually sinking in, and there's some marvelous papers, particularly by somebody called John Gagnon, whose uh, best-selling American book is there called The Energetics of Food, and he's just republished it and got two wonderful chapters on how we have to look for what all our ancient texts are telling us, that we had uh, very clever gods who delivered the seeds and delivered this advanced technology for us, which the church, of course, wouldn't accept. The oldest recorded domesticated fig was found just down from Karsag. I'm using this word Karsag, which means to the Sumerians met head enclosure, base camp, if you like, for the small group of people who restarted civilization around about 9,500 B.C., and this is found at Gilgal 1, just eight miles north of Jericho, in that Rift Valley, which would have been a very good climate. Um, it's low down, and it would have produced a, a, an excellent climate at this particular time, 9,500 BC, for the more, more exotic plants um, that these people were cultivating and producing. Um, and as the same with all our domesticated crops, um, they cannot survive if they are not um, dealt with by humans. In other words, it wasn't for human, invent human intervention and planting them each year and constant farming, they wouldn't survive. So one of the clues of a continuity of farming is to see where we have lost certain crops or where certain crops have survived over a long period of time. And that's another clue in looking at our agricultural record. This variety of fig, known as a parthenocarpic, the fruit develops without insect pollination and is prevented from falling off the tree, allowing it to ripen. We find similar situations with dates and many other the plants that they require human intervention to do this pollinating process. And we're going to look at the ancients holding 
their sacred basket. Now, we have history books, and some of our best history books are the oldest ones. The difficulty has been in translating the language. And fortunately, we have what are called archaic cuneiform texts. And this is one of the oldest. Archaic cuneiform means pushing dates back probably to 5000 BC or earlier. And these may well have been copies of earlier documents. And this is man's golden age. This was the time when they described it as the blissful and unrivaled state of man in an area of universal peace before he'd learned to know fear and before the confusion of tongues. Very similar to the Genesis text. And this comes from a book on Sumerian mythology by Samuel Noah Kramer. So the Golden Age, you've all heard people talk about a Golden Age. Well, let's just see who's talking about it here. The Alexandrians, and remember Alexandria was a major center, far more important than Greece in reality, for ancient knowledge. It was set up by the Greeks and it pulled together a tremendous amount of information. So the Alexandrians, in their view, like that of the book of Genesis, was that man had fallen from grace and that developed society was deficient compared to the golden age of the past. They shared this opinion with many other thinkers of classical antiquity, notably the 8th century uh, BC Greek poet Hesiod and, and his wonderful, wonderful book, Work and Days, and Lucretius. But in China, we've got the same message. When the great Tao prevailed, the whole world was one community. Men of talent and virtue were chosen to lead the people. Their words were sincere and they cultivated harmony. This was called the age of universality. So Confucius is talking about the same golden age. And remember, Confucius is the man who put a very simple language together. And his concept of religion was very simple. One word, reciprocacy. Do unto others as it happened to do unto you. Um, 400 B.C. 400 years before Jesus. That was a common message at the time. And that's really all you need to know about religion, in my opinion, to keep it simple and then make sure you do it. And China, remember, is immensely important now. And the Chinese, um, I don't show it in this talk, but the Chinese were led originally by Hung Ti, who really was Nung Ti, um, and Shen Nong, who was Sargon I. Um, and they were the back Sing tribes who migrated from Mesopotamia at the time of a much later global catastrophe than the one we were looking at um, and moved down into India and moved into China. So Shen Nong, the farmer, was in fact Sargon and Hung Ti was Nung Ti. So we have a tradition in China which has preserved so much of the um, Sumerian culture and the culture, of course, of the Golden Age. Lao Tzu lived at just about the same time, and uh, he wrote this wonderful book called Vita Te Ching. Uh, he was on his way to actually to the west, to the mountains, to find, to look for the ancient masters, the gods, who always lived in the west, wherever you were, wherever you were. In time, you get to the Mount Hermon area, and then you get further across, and then they're in the east, so you can locate where the original mountain was. But he was going out of the gate on his ox, and the gatekeeper who knew him well said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm off to the mountains to find the gods, or the ancient masters. And the gatekeeper said, well, you can't go. You haven't written anything down. And anyway, the gatekeepers persuaded him to stay and write his book before he left, because otherwise uh, it would be a complete waste of time for, it to have been a, for him to have been a great philosopher and scholar. So that's what he did. And he was never heard of again. We never know what happened to him, but it's a lovely story. And this is what he thinks, and this is our benevolent source. Uh, the ancient masters were subtle, mysterious, profound, responsive. The depth of their knowledge is unfathomable. Because it is unfathomable, all we can so to do is describe their appearance. Watchful, like men crossing a winter stream. Alert, like men aware of danger. Courteous, like visiting guests. Yielding, like ice about to melt. Simple, like uncarved blocks of wood. I believe that's a beautiful poem and sums up what the ancients thought about the people who had delivered civilization, law and order, agriculture, etc. to them. Then we turn to Plato a little later. And Plato is supposed to be the thinking man's philosopher and he's written several very important documents. He doesn't seem to have let us any of us down on anything he said apart from Atlantis, which some people question. 
But this is what he says. Once upon a time, the gods divided up the earth between them, not in a course of a quarrel, for it would be quite wrong to think that the gods do not know what is appropriate to them, or that knowing it, they would want to annex what property belongs to others. Each gladly received his just allocation and settled his territories, and having done so, they proceeded to look after us, their creatures and children, as shepherds look after their flocks. They did not use physical means of control like shepherds, who direct their flocks with blows, but brought their influence to bear on the creature's most sensitive part, using persuasion as a steersman uses the helm to direct the mind as they saw fit and so guide the whole moral creature. They don't look like baddies to me there. Then we've got another statement by Plato because this is uh, all about the marvelous Greek, perhaps the most famous Greek of all really, because he was the man who really set modern Greece or modern ancient Greece on its way by sorting out the law and reorganizing things after chaos called Solon. And Solon visited the um, so-called temple of Neith. And Neith was this lady Ninkasag. Um, and he had a discussion uh, with uh, Sontius, who was a priest. And Sontius said, O oh, Solon, you Greeks are all young in your minds, which hold no store or old belief in a long tradition. No knowledge hoary with age. This is about commentary, catastrophe, disasters of various kinds. But in the truth of it, uh, behind it, is a deviation of the bodies that revolve in heaven around the earth and the destruction occurring at long intervals of things on earth by a great conflagration. When once more, after the usual period of years, the torrents from the heavens swept down like a pestilence, leaving only the rude and unlettered among you. And it says just lower down that to begin with, your people remember one deluge, though there were many earlier, and moreover, you do not know, know that the noblest and bravest race in the world once lived in your country. Back to this glowing references to the gods, the ancient gods of Greece. Now this is where Christian O'Brien comes in because he wanted to know where the uh, where these master builders came from who built all these structures which took him to Sumer and looked and decided that he was going to learn how to translate the cuneiform text because of him quite rightly that was the area you had to look to see what did the very earliest record keepers have to say about all this and this is archaic tablet 8383 um, there are um, 13 of the tablets he translated them all to give us a story which is in the genius of the few about Karsag and everything that happened there, Karsag being the Garden of Eden. And this is what Samuel Noah Kramer says in about 1963. There's good reason to hope that the not-too-distant future will see the better part of its contents ready for translation. And O'Brien took up that task. And what he produced was this. And I'm only going to do one tablet because the others can all be read in your own time if you want to look. At Karsag, which means head enclosure, where heaven and earth meet, the heavenly assembly, the great sons of Anu, descended, the many wise ones. The lord of the granary had not yet arrived there. The grass had not yet become green. The lord of the plough had not yet prepared the land and its watering. For the lord of the plough, that implement, had not yet turned over the hard earth. The cattle shed, had not been given running water, and so on and so on. Irrigation channels, bright sunny enclosure, um, the lord of the granary, the Anunnaki, the great lords, had not yet arrived. The shesh grain of 30 days did not exist. The shesh grain of 50 days did not exist. The small grain, the mountain grain, and the animal fodder did not exist. So we have a lovely, basic, down-to-earth story of farmers and farming, which matches both the Genesis text and also the books of Enoch, where we have three totally different records of the same situation. I said earlier we know where, most, where the likeliest place is for the st start of agriculture, and it centers on this area here around Damascus. And here are the snow-capped mountains of the Lebanon mountains and the anti-Lebanon, with Mount Hermon at the end of the anti-Lebanon range. Some people think that Armenia and the area around Lake Van and this much northern area was where agriculture started. But for a whole number of region, regions, a build-up of ice 
and the fact that vegetation didn't even reach here until about 3000 BC. This area being a glacial refuge was far more appropriate, far more serious contender for uh, the, the original starting point. And looking at the map, this is interesting, interesting too. I put this in because it just shows Damascus there, Sidon, Tyre, Beirut, Baalbek, sorry, Beirut there. And you can see um, the Sea of Galilee, the Rift Valley, Jordan, Nazareth. You can see here um, extraordinary location. It would, if anybody uh, was really clever, that's where they would have chosen to go at that particular point in time in history. And so much of our history is tied into this area with uh, us being told that Tyre and Sidon were the two oldest cities and ports in the world to the very much earlier land of Canaan rather than the land of Phoenicia. This is a close-up of the area. O'Brien, having located the probability of something important happening here, had to look at where people could have farmed and would have farmed. And he looked at um, these sites, A, C, D, um, and um, somewhere else here, A, B, C, and D, and chose, uh, sorry, A, B, the northern Rakaia Basin, A, the Rakaia Basin south, and decided that this was the most probable location of the Garden of Eden site. And he had a very important thing to help him. He had Enoch's detailed descriptions of his journey to the top of Mount Hermon and being walked down into this area, which is about eight miles, by the two angels who took him to see everything and to record what was going on. Still called the Mountain of the Chief or the Snowy Mountain in Arabic. And the havens here are the havens described in the books of Enoch. Um, there's all sorts of explanations by other historians as to what these havens are, but this one, I believe, makes the most sense because it ties everything together. And that's the Google image view. Uh, this area, the Rakaia Basin south, north of Mount Hermon here, um, and this is the, uh, you've got a, a basin there, which is probably an old lake bed, and another similar basin to the north, and a high ridge of land here. And the clues were, uh, O'Brien put together in his book, which he wrote in 85, remember, he put together from the French Ordnance Survey map uh, where the reservoir would have been, because it's very clear from the contours where you would construct a reservoir, and only that one place, where the overflow water course would have to go to take all the storm water when there is too much water in the area, which in certain times of the year, in this particular location, with all the winter snows and melting of winter snows, uh, and any storms, mountain storms, you get tremendous quantities of water coming down, and then the summers are incredibly dry, so you have this problem of going from very wet to very dry, so you have to have a storm water course to take all the water away. And a water course which will literally uh, ration out or collect uh, water for irrigation during the summer months. And that's also why the crops were so critical, and how long those crops took to mature, from the time they were planted to the time you could harvest the seeds. So what I want you to look at here is this is not to scale some of these, but he's talking about the building of knowledge. I'm going to look at Enil's great house and come to that later on, another, another extraordinary link. But this was the great house which Enil built uh, for his own use, which was in a wonderful, prominent position, seeing everything, so he could see everything from his bedroom, bedroom window, like every farmer likes to do, and cattle sheds, etc., houses for the watchers, um, and this great watercourse. You can see the line of the watercourse from the dam. So on the Google Images, there we have, you can see here, right where one would expect it following the contours, what looks like, I believe is, when you look close, the remains of the great watercourse. So here we have all the clues of the Garden of Eden and physical structures on the ground. And it's a gigantic canal, massive the closer you get, you can see it's clearly built uh, of, must be built of large stones or rock, cut through the rock, as the great ditch around Jericho was. Nobody knew how they could do it because of the technology they used. It just seems impossible that you can go through hard granite or basalt, um, like cutting cheese, but that's what they seem to have done. Although in the old text, there were all sorts of complaints 
from the workers about having to build that, and that was a big problem for them. And one of the excuses given why they started uh, creating man himself to provide an extra labor force for the operations. And then here you have an even larger version here. And it looks as though they collected water from both sides and was another channel came in here. And the complex here of structures, which some, they may be recent, but said that there's so much interest, interest on the ground here that we're hoping that the Lebanese authorities will allow a preliminary investigation and start really looking. And it's fairly straightforward these days to get pollen cores and to very quickly start dating pollen and building up a profile of exactly what was happening there. Because we're looking for all the cedar trees, the cedar forest. We have a story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu going to the cedar forest. Well, this is where it would have been. The gatekeeper would have been the person um, at the gate of the garden, which was an enclosure and enclosed. Whether it was part of it was enclosed in stone, because that's what it says, but much of it would, would have possibly been enclosed by a pale fence of some kind. And so lots of the ancient stories tie in with people here. And in every religion, uh, you have similar clues that the gods, the sons of the gods, lived near Mount Hermon, for example, in the Hebraic records. Now, the famous lady, the famous person, really, at this settlement was a lady. And this is particularly relevant when we start thinking about equality and women's role and all the rest of it and see what's happened to women over the, since the Golden Age. And here we have head biologist, brightest spark of the lot was a lady who was given the name Ninkarsag, or Ninil Ninkarsag, many other names um, which evolve here. But she's the queen of heaven. Um, she's the goddess of irrigation. Um, and we may find that paying respects to uh, uh, springs and wells and a goddess of irrigation um, all tie back to the lady Ninkarsag. And she says here, with this settlement will come prosperity, an enclosed reservoir, a water trap shall be established. The good land is full of water. Because of the water, food will be plentiful. Very interesting. Now, she hasn't got a space helmet on, as Zechariah Sitchin tells us she had, and she's holding a big vase. And this is a statue in the middle of one of the most important early cities called Mari. And somebody called Andrew Parrott, who was a famous archaeologist, uh, excavated Mari. And this was one of the objects that was found. And it was literally a fountain in the center, most important part of the palace, where the water came up through the body and out through the vase. And there are cylinder seals showing the four streams of water from the same kind of person holding a vase. If you go to the British Museum and many other museums around the world, you will find these extraordinary people who seem to be wearing wings uh, with uh, holding a sacred basket. And uh, there's all sorts of things here. It's all about the pineal gland and uh, everything. But my view is it's straightforward, uh, simple pollination of plants, which all horticulturists and gardeners will know a great deal about. And we find that tradition, um, interestingly, in many, many places. And these figures uh, were, they had to be drawn to a, in a certain way. And that tradition of drawing them in a certain way uh, carried down from something like um, 5,300 B.C. to the um, palace of Ashburnapar, where many of these figures were found in the central throne room. Uh, the history of the Assyrians was written on them, but they were considered to be the gods who had delivered civilization to the Assyrians. Now, we just only have to go across to Mexico, La Venta, and you can just see that the, the, the same sacred basket here. Do you see the sacred basket being held in the hand of a man on this statue? And the snake, which is often represented as the plumed serpent god. We find the same traditions um, which we saw in Assyria um, in Mexico. And then we go to northern Mexico. La Venta is on the coast, uh, further down south. But in the north, further, further north, we go to Tula, and we have the same basket being held in the statues of the gods. On this, look at this platform here. It's absolutely magnificent. One of my networkers took this photograph, a magnificent photograph of Tula in Mexico. And the sculptures are what are called the Apkalu. If you go to the British Museum and say, what are they? They say the Apkalu or genies. And they're supposed to be spirit beings, mythological creatures. 
And this is part of what we've been led to believe by church and everybody else, is that, oh, all that's myth. It's dismissed as myth. The word myth, that just simply means incredible. So if it's too incredible for a pretty basic person to understand, then it's a myth and dismissed as something which didn't exist. Now we're going to look at the hierarchy, the people who were in Kasa, the Garden of Eden, because it gives us so many clues. And it also helps to explain so much of the confusion. I'm going to read it out because it's so important. Names from the text appear in this brief summary to provide a guide to establish other names used for the same role, the same individual, or subsequent successors within an ordered and disciplined role society. The Most High, which is the common Hebrew word for God, is, equates with the supreme commander of the Anunnaki, or the leader of the Shining Ones. Yahweh Elohim actually means the leader of the Shining Ones. And all through the land of Canaan, where men and women were the heads of the administration in the towns, rather like our mayor and mayoress, it was always Yahweh and Asherah of Dan, Yahweh and Asherah of Beersheba, whatever it may be. Each of the communities had a male and a female figure. And if the man wasn't married, he would have a consort who was involved. So men and women were represented um, equally in just the same way our mayor and mayoress tradition has survived from those times. Now, Anne is the name given to the supreme commander at this particular point in time by the Sumerians. He's called Anu by the later Akkadians. In Egypt, he's called Pa, uh, although he was originally uh, Pa Anu. So we find Anne being the earliest key person in Egypt as well as Mesopotamia. And these are all the African tribe names from uh, Philip Blair's marvelous book, God's credentials, and these are all related to the same person. And, of course, Allah is the same, Amun. We say Amen at the end of our prayers. Uh, Baal. Baal means the great Lord, um, and Baal Hadad was the great Lord Hadad, um, who appears to have been a son and successor of Ann. We also get the word Baal. Uh, sun God comes into it as well. And we have Manu, uh, which is just putting an M onto the Anu, Manitou to the North American Indians, Mancopec, Manco Copec in South America, and then we have El Shaddai and El Elyon, the mountain gods of Abraham, and presumably the role leaders or the supreme commander of the Anunnaki at later times. Uh, also, we've got Quetzalcoatl in the same way. And what we find, of course, is that Yahweh would have been to appear, appear to be the title specifically adopted for an individual at a much later date. So the first key point I'm making in this talk is that we have two claimants to be the supreme god uh, of um, all of us, Anne or Yahweh. Um, and if we believe that God was a real person, then we need to take the senior one, who is Anne. If we are looking at a different form of God, uh, we may be looking at members of the family at a later time, or we might be trying to put a name on um, the Great Spirit, uh, and most of the uh, so-called primitive tribes didn't have any doubt in saying that God was really the supreme uh, or the Great Spirit, the great um, force within nature, within life, and everything around us. And that same great spirit is also in us as well. It's just a question of how we performed on earth in order to fulfill that role. And plugging into the intelligent and responsive universe seems to be the best way of explaining what is required for individuals and not to be hanging one's hat on uh, material which uh, clearly may well have been distorted over time. The Lord of the Spirits is the second person, and there's a lot of complications around the spirit, which comes from the Greek pneuma, and there may not have even been an intention to use that word. We know what we use it for, more or less. And, but we also have an interesting situation. that The confusions here also arose because uh, Enil, who was a key person here, was 
um, always originally the lord of the cultivation, lord of the hoe, lord of the pickaxe. But then later translators, religious translators, regarded him as lord of the wind. And his name was associated with a plant pot, and it was called Li. And they translated Li as wind rather than Li as cultivation. But it was one of the problems in the translations and how Christianity and Christian beliefs and, and Christian upbringing allowed people to put a religious slant on almost everything they did. And that's why it's become so difficult for us to understand the past. Now, the seven archangels um, were called two-eyed serpents. Uh, if you have two eyes on the go, you're supposed to be cleverer than the one-eyed serpents who were the ordinary angels. Um, and they were the Anunnaki council of seven, seven teachers, the seven rishis, the ancient masters, the Abkalu, the genie. We're going to come to those later. Gabriel was the governor of Karsag, and this role was played by Nina or Ninkarsag, a woman. And she is called Inanna, Belit, Isis, Neith, Mamar, Mamar, actually called Mamar in Akkadian, Kali, Ka, um, Kotaliku, Serpent Lady, Queen of Heaven, Earth Mother. Then we have Uriel, who is Enki, and we all know about Enki. Enki and Enil appear to be brothers. Enki was lord of the land. Um, he was also Ragyal, some wisdom and law. And then we have Utu, Ugmash, Sharmash, Ogimus, Ogma, Lug. And we find the Druids actually using Ogma and having this tradition of Utu following right the way through. Utu also is the musician and the man who talks about music. Michael is the captain of the guard. So the angel Michael means captain of the guard. And there were lots of captains of the guard, different people, different times, who had probably different names. So I hope you're getting the message about a royal society, a very well-organized administrative structure. Raphael was the chief medical officer. Um, Sario, the representative of the watchers. So the watchers were represented on the Anunnaki Council. And Remiel, supervisor instructions. So that far, you've got this extraordinary N head of nine, which you see all over the world, the ninefold pantheon of gods who begat gods. So you start with your single monotheistic system, but as soon as they have children and relations and further down the line, then you're getting into a lot of gods, and at some point later on you find that everybody's sick of so many gods and they've forgotten the fact that it was one guy who started the whole thing. And the angels were the one-eyed serpents. They weren't quite so bright as the two-eyed serpents. And if they're good enough, they got promoted to the archangels. Um, and Elohim, Engeli, word comes Engeli, uh, which mean, also means Lord of the Cultivation, Abkalu, uh, Jini, Dujin, Dujun, Malak, Hashanim, Tuapadanan, serpents and druids. Because the druids would say, we are the serpents, we are the druids. They were transmitting what we call the serpent knowledge. So when Patrick went to Ireland to try and banish the serpents or snakes, uh, he was trying to get rid of the old system. And when St. George, the fabricated story of George killing a dragon, which was entirely put together by the Church of Rome, uh, George smote or killed the dragon. The reality was that George was George of um, Lydia, L-Y-D-I-A, and he was the Arian Bishop of Alexandria, the most important Christian at the time that Rome was trying to gain control of Christianity. And Constantine, on his deathbed, was blessed by an Arian bishop because Christians were Arian Christians. They didn't believe in all the mumbo-jumbo, I'm afraid I have to put it that way, which came later. This is the, one of the uh, images we have, the Most High, the Supreme Lord Anu, with statuettes from Tel Asmar. And this is a lovely picture back to Herge in the 30s. This is what the archaeologists produce, uh, professional archaeologists. A lovely quote, the great gods foregather. Death and life they determine, but of death they do not reveal. They didn't really reveal what happened in the spiritual world or after the death. And here we have Genie or Abkalu from Ashburnar's palace. And the museum quote says, bas relief of a priest who is represented wearing a divine wings, apparel peculiar to the, his office, and carrying a goat on his left forearm, 
while he holds aloft in his right hand an ear of corn. This bas-relief once formed part of the decorations of the palace built by Ashburnipal II at Nimrod. So that's a modern version. Um, you can see that it didn't, there are all sorts of complications there, and I hope that my explanations provide better explanations. Um, and I'm going to go a little further now with another one holding a Mesopotamian fallow deer. And this is O'Brien's specific interpretation or analysis was that the Elohim were not making animals but caring for them and tending them as all good farmers do. Down-to-earth farming. And the church couldn't accept that down-to-earth farmers could have a place in our church canon and biblical records. Current genetic knowledge now recognizes the application of advanced scientific knowledge and practice in the domestication of wild plants and animals from around 9000 BC in what would appear from the evidence to be a restart of civilization after major catastrophe. In the current confrontational debate between creationists and evolutionists, both parties need to address their misunderstandings of past events. This is where the story of a Nephilim comes in, and I've got some very good papers, one being prepared at the moment by somebody looking at the subject, because we find very large people and very small people, and you'll see later we also find different racial types all arriving at the same time um, with the influence of what I would call the Shining Ones. Uh, modern giants, well, uh, this man is nine foot tall, perfectly fit, not a growth hormone. He's able to do his work very well. We know that um, I think three in a million people do have pituitary growth horm uh, problems, tumors, which create height, but it isn't always the case. Um, this was a Roman emperor who had absolutely no problems at all, but he was eight foot six tall, and that's overlooked by everybody. This, they thought, was the world's tallest man, seven foot seven, Bao Xing, and this is the world's smallest. And he's called Hei Ping Ping, and he's two foot four. But no sooner did this appeared in the press that a Ukrainian vet <laughs> rang up the Guinness Book of Records and said, hang on a minute, I'm eight foot five, <laughs> living and working normally um, in, in Ukraine. And this is the very famous, to, uh, in the Middle Ages, the child of Hale, who was nine foot three, born in 1578, and he used to take on about four or five men at the same time, so he was totally physically capable and able of performing and lived a healthy and full life as a, as, as a great celebrity in London. We're now back to another of the lovely Herge stories, which is the Sumerian story of the farmer God, and the farmers will love this one, early third millennium. Cow and calf he caused to multiply, much fat and milk he caused to be produced, that's from the Sumerian myth about the farmer god. We can, they call them, have to be called myths because they couldn't possibly start telling true stories about that kind of thing. Uh, another wonderful um, re re reproduction here of an actual structure. That city was ancient and so were the gods within it. That's from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Here's our Abkalu doing something fertilizing plants in my mind, wearing this basic uniform which they had to wear, and we're going to look at why they had wings. And ab means father, if it's connected with the enclosure, which is car. Lu means bright. So the real meaning of these words that the British Museum use is they are the bright farmers from the enclosure. And that's one of the images we have of the Egyptian creator god, and that is an image of the same person as we have with the Mesopotamians, Pa Anu. Uh, just to dwell a w little while on this, because I have big arguments, as you probably gather, with people who believe in angels. And um, we have so many things in our memories, which the church perhaps has put there, about angels. But um, because they are the bright farmers from the enclosure and they have wings, people imagine that they, um, they could fly. Well, they may well have flown, but I doubt very much whether they use wings like that. And we have all sorts of maybe something like 18 references in the Bible about the Ruah in which people were flying around in and all the ancient stories talk about the gods flying around but I won't get into that area but uh, Enoch has this lovely quote their clothes this is when the two angels visited him and, and took him up to heaven to record all that was going on or the plant in Highlands their clothes were remarkable being purplish with the appearance of feathers 
and on their shoulders were things that I can only describe like golden wings. Here we have a Maori princess in 1921 wearing a most marvellous, marvellous feather coat. And I believe that they were using natural materials like feathers to produce clothes, which would have been wonderful clothes, special clothes, um, which would have done all sorts of things. And I think the idea that they had wings was a mistaken uh, identity by Enoch, or could have been a mistaken uh, identity by Enoch, but it stuck within the folklore. But clearly, it was very important to describe the Abkalu, or the uh, archangels and angels, uh, as having wings. That, was a, uh, a de that denoted that they were divine beings. That was the, word, the words that we used. Measuring rod and tape, the measurements of the fields. Um, you've got uh, the rolled measuring tape and the measuring rod. This is the divine triad, two male and one female at Tel Halaf. That's a man there, look. It's in the German Museum. And you've got Anu, Enil, and Linkasag. Our triad is two men and a woman. Here we have pygmies. Pygmies were once a single indigenous group spread around the world in ancient times, but eventually hunted, killed, enslaved, or eaten, mainly by the Negro race. They originally evolved closely linked genetically uh, to white Europeans. They're very close to us. Uh, I say us, um, to the white uh, Indo-Europeans. Um, perhaps it's a racist remark when this was written, but Jean-Pierre Halle wrote a wonderful book called The Pygmy Bible, which just supports and confirms all I'm telling you now. But the pygmies have a higher brain capacity per volume of their weight than we do, and a significantly higher intelligence ability too. They're capable of learning five languages very quickly, knowing all the names of the trees and plants in the forest, and the diseases of those plants and how those diseases can be fixed. Quite extraordinary, and we're beginning to learn from the pygmies and the Dogon tribe and a lot of these people that they had passed down this knowledge from the past and they were, I believe, um, part of this role society. They were genetically bred to do a certain job to make the world run more smoothly. And it was, um, if you like, um, a genetic manipulation for the benefit of the planet, which we are now forced to consider now with all the problems we have. Enoch records all these records, and Enoch talks about measuring, and uh, angels with measuring cords, irrigation, water, rain gauges, the sluices. This is all about the Garden of Eden site. And also the study of the stars and the moon. So the first records we have of people who are surveying the stars and doing all kinds of fantastic work are the angels in these very early books, which takes us right back to 9,500 BC. And their angels study mankind and record the behavior of men and how they live. Let that stick in your mind for a moment, because we're going to deal with that in a moment. Canaan stone was uh, part of the Jubilees, and this is about um, Noah's grandson, Canaan. And he found a writing which former generations had carved upon a rock, and he read what was thereon, and he transcribed it, and sinned owing to it, for it contained the teaching of the watchers in according with which they used to observe the omens of the sun and the moon and the stars, all the signs of heaven. And he wrote it down and said nothing about it because he was afraid to speak to Noah about it lest he should be angry with him on account of it. Wonderful piece. The recording angel in original sin, um, this is um, something where the angels were simply recording the behavior of men and how they lived. They weren't making judgments about them. And O'Brien makes this point that um, they were not concerned with guilt or original sin. And this particular part of a text was used to tell us that original sin was important. And this is a little bit on the watchers about pen and ink, and uh, men were not created for such a purpose to confirm their good intentions with pen and ink. <laughs> and Cash de Jean, or de Jean Cash, was uh, an equivalent to um, who we find in the old Irish in the two Alfred and Anne legends. We find an exact parallel with him um, in the uh, area of... Um, um, both Carsag and in Ireland. And many years later, Enoch found them there. And this is when the watchers were uh, getting a bit restless and, and uh, wanting to mate with the other women in the area. And that was made into a big story by the church, as you know. Bow back very quickly. All we great Anunnaki decided to give on a rule. Anu and Hadad, or Adad, and that's where we possibly get the word dad from, 
would rule the highlands and I, Enel, would rule the lowlands. And so we have Enel at Karsag taking the land right the way down into the Rift Valley and the Anno taking, and Adair taking the land at Baalbek. And this is the spring. Jericho had a great spring. Karsag had the water supply, crucial in any early settlement. That is the massive platform at Baalbek. And that is the trilithons. And the, the, the knowledge of these large stones was that they were built by Cain to hide from the wrath of God. And the same story goes for Persophilus. There's another story in the Arabic that um, the, the, this platform was built by Bin, son of Jan, and as lurking places for the genii to hide. So they're taking shelter in these structures from a commentary debris that's being thrown at them, and they had to make these big structures so they could provide rooms and for valuables and chambers underneath. That's the stone of the south, 1,250 tons. It didn't reach the temple, but the three 850-ton stones did. Uh, there is the corrosion, which shows that that uh, early structure, built like a, almost like a master bar, is much, much earlier than the Roman construction on top. That's a view from the temple platform. That's where the columns uh, of the main temple were in pink Aswan granite and take, brought all the way from Egypt in the early Canaan times. Remember, the Roman, Roman history goes back to 700 B.C., and that's 1,250 tons, but it broke, so they didn't move it. And you tell me how they moved it. That's what the whole platform was. It's the most important place in the world. Uh, and it was always said the gods lived at the head of the two rivers, and the two rivers were the Orontes and, the, and then the um, Latani. And so we have the home of the gods moving later times from Karsag. Um, well, actually, quite soon after Karsag was established, we get the spread and diffusion of the groups of teachers um, and people around. That's where we get the diffusion of the gods. Early sophistication, we've got the ruins at Jericho's, Jericho at 9,300 B.C. We've got Catalhoyuk 2,000 years later um, at 7,500 B.C. We've got the Halafian ceramics, the most marvelous ceramics, which haven't really been surpassed until maybe the 18th century, some people say. Uh, so great sophistication at 6,500 B.C. in reality now, in the redating. Then we've got the ceramic combs. The paints are still bright, as bright now, nearly as bright as they were when they were put up 6,000 years ago. And the paint manufacturers have discovered that they heated the paint in the process before they painted these pegs, which they drove in to decorate all the mud brick buildings and protect them from erosion. And the paint manufacturers now realize that by heating the paint, they can make paint colors last very much longer. That technology is 6,000 years old. There is the most wonderful uh, sculpture of a lady of war because she would have had um, quartz eyes polished, uh, copper eyebrows, a wig, and she would have looked exactly as she had done, perfect representation. 4,000 BC, clear Aryan type. Um, and we find Aryan types, all the racial groups, all living in harmony together in Samaria from the earliest times. I want to make that point. That is the kind of beauty created. Warka is the same place as Uruk. The dates have all been moved back with Uruk or Warka uh, being a great city um, around 4,500 B.C. and lasting till 3,250 B.C. from the archaeological record. But look at all these wonderful features here. And these are actually the symbols of Ninkarsag on those troughs with the animals. So Ninkarsag, much later on, is associated with the animals and farming and that water trough or food trough, whatever it is. Um, here we have this 150-ton block at Giza, which is dated way before 3000 BC in the Valley Temples. We just don't know how old they are, but they're certainly much, much older than the pyramids. And here is machine granite. We've got evidence of machine granite at Saqqara and waterworks and water systems. And my belief, and I think other people's belief now, is that they were raising vast quantities of water from the Nile to canal over to the areas of Siwa and Fayum and all the settlements which were drying out as the Sahara dried out. They desperately need water to keep those operations going. And they were pumping water at Thebes and Giza. And this is the Saqqara. And here is machine granite. And you find a lot of this type of material very, very early in Egypt, out in the desert before they came into the valleys. So five, six, seven thousand BC, you had clever people producing this kind of quality stonework. 
And remember, too, that the uh, art was fantastic. The best art is 2,900 BC, perfect representations of a species of, of, of geese um, there at that time. And the art deteriorates over the next um, 1,500 years. So the best work is the earliest work, very important point. And here is one of the most marvelous things. This is a wooden statue, and it's of Ka Appa, who was an overseer of one of the villages in Egypt. And when they looked at these eyes, they were quartz, created from quartz, which was polished to as high a standard as we can do today. In other words, it was as good as we can do today at that time. And all the features made him look totally lifelike. And he looked so much like somebody in the village that when they excavated it, everybody got terribly excited. <laughs> Um, but that's one of the great wonders, I think, of the world, that timber structure surviving from that time. And I've got a book called Her Back, which is uh, uh, Lubavitch, um, one of the great um, Egyptian archaeologists. Um, his wife wrote a fantastic story about Her Back, which is Chickpea, and how he lived, and all the people he met and talked to, and from the text in Egypt, and the degree of sophistication in their education. Casing joints in the Great Pyramid, 2,500 BC. You can't put a knife between them. Tell me what kind of technology can do that. And the world of the Abrahamic faith. This is Ur, and the royal headdress at Ur, uh, the enormous structures at Ur, and Uruk, at Eridu and Uruk, which were nearby. Um, the temple of Anu here. Um, so we find them coming right back into, uh, following right through. This is a city uh, before the Great Bronze Age, uh, civilization was destroyed. Tepegawa, occupation mound, where we find remains going back to eight, 9,000 BC through different levels in those Mesopotamian plains. Um, the areas of cultivation, urban populations, and large towns before 2,900. Um, and the Nippa Library, where these tablets were found. And this is Nippa, and you've got called Ika, the mountain house, dedicated to Enil. And down here, you've got a temple to Inanna. So you've got these two original people, Enil and his wife, Inanna, being, um, re the situation being reproduced in the main administrative and scholarly establishment in Samaria at Nippur. And there is the site of Enil's house, uh, we believe, in the overlooking the Garden of Eden at Karsag on a three or four hundred feet above that level, looking down into the, where the reservoir was in this valley here. And there's a water supply. There is extraordinary. At the top of the hill, there is a pond. And that's just what we see the ancient people doing, finding a spring above that level and then ducting, aqueducting down and underneath the valley up to that site so that the water uh, is there all the time, even though it's on a hill. And that was very common with all the early fortifications and all the early structures and sites. Doliveria in India, um, wonderful town, again, about this time. Um, they would look, make our um, water board uh, and water authorities look a little silly because they, they saved every drop of water. They had to, but they had flush loos. They made use of all the human waste, um, and they allowed the river to flood into large tanks around the town so they could collect water during the rainy season to get them through the dry season. And further down the valley river, you've got Lothal, the mouth of the Indus River, the docks, um, going back to those early times, and then we've got double hull canoes, this technology identical to the boats found at Ferriby in Yorkshire and in Egypt, the sewn planks um, without nails, um, and able to sail backwards and forwards across the Pacific, no trouble at all. And we find the Indus Valley and the East Island scripts identical, the talking boards there. And it's also very similar to the Minoan writing, picture signs, pictorial text. And we find the same kind of picture signs in Mexico at very early dates. Common threads throughout the world, common language, common tongues, as we saw from the, the Golden Age project tablet. Paracas, a part of the Peruvian desert, immensely rich sea because of the Humboldt current and the mixture of uh, cold and warm water. And there we find the early colonies from Mesopotamia and colonies from Egypt here, similar structures as we find in Mesopotamia. But interestingly, Lake Titicata Plateau, we've got the remains of Puma Ponca, where you have quite a different culture with massive stones, 26 feet long and 16 foot wide. And here you have a plateau 
which our experts will now tell us did rise by many thousands of feet. So it was at, at sea level, and now it's halfway up the mountain. And that's because of these massive convulsions in the Earth's crust when we had the axis shift. And then we have pyramids, uh, big pyramids here, and a, a way all the way up, dried out now. And but we've got people doing extraordinary things, 3,500 BC, 1,000 years before the Great Pyramids. Now, there is our Ninkar Sag. She's defiled after the, uh, the end of the Golden, golden Age uh, that she was defiled. She's got a rod and ring, the bent rod, a stupid helmet with many horns on it, which she didn't have anyway, crow's feet, and she's got a goat bell, a sheep bell, and a cattle bell around her neck, and droopy wings and owls. And so what they did is denigrated the old gods. And we see this uh, here. There is the very earliest archaic reconstructions of Enil, and Ninkar Sag, he's got the horn feet there. He was seen as the cattle god. Uh, all these images of animal heads come into the culture of how people saw their importance. But here we have the Bernie relief, which denigrated Ninkar Sag, and the similarity with Isis, the similarity with Astarte, because it's the same. And then when we get to the Americas, much, much later, she's the late serpent lady, Kotuliku, a goddess. Uh, Lady of the Serpent, she's got a rattlesnake skirt, etc. And when Cortes gets to Mexico City, then people are being slaughtered, having their hearts torn out in her name in Mexico City. So she follows through, but she's turned from a lovely lady, very intelligent, giver of everything, to uh, a complete monster by the time we get to the Americas um, of Cortes and Montezuma. Law and order, here is uh, law and order being dispensed in the name of Ninkar Sag, a last chair stuck in the village, in just the same way as we used to administer India and other parts of the colony with our regional magistrates and our district magistrates and commissioners. India was managed by 700 men who went round and kept good order at local level. Lord of the Rings, uh, the, uh, the handing over of the rod and the ring to the king by Sharmesh, and Sharmash is one of the key figures or key roles of different people over a long period of time, remember. And the origin of law um, was, if you look at the top of the stele, this is very important because it seems to be missed by everybody, Thorkub Jacobson in Treasures of Darkness who translated the tablet, this, sorry, the, the cuneiform on this uh, black stele, which is in the Louvre, says, these are the edicts of Anu and Enil. Our laws come right down from 9,500 BC. And they also, very important, Sumerian law gave equal rights to women and false accusers were regarded and punished in a similar manner to thieves and murderers. Just think what would happen if we did that today. And neither God nor king was above the law. Robert Mugabe is above the law. Saddam Hussein was above the law. We just needed to discipline those two people and look how much less trouble there would have been the Urgmash tablet, Shamash. Same situation, giving, giving out law and order, but O'Brien makes this point that he's actually described as the two-eyed serpent in this picture. And O'Brien's conclusion is how he reached the, one of the reasons he reached this conclusion of a two-eyed serpent being uh, not a snake at all, but a very clever, wise man. So when we talk about serpent knowledge and the angels and the archangels, we're talking about extremely clever people, that tradition. Women and the law, this is a, 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 even earlier than the Harappai Code. Not many people know there's the laws of Ashnunna. And they might even not know that when Malutius recomposed the laws in Britain in 500 BC, which lasted until Alfred the Great. This is the kind of women, and, and this is Africa, the Sahara, uh, the Amazai, uh, I think that's right, or the Berbers. Or the, uh, and we have very sophisticated people uh, living in North Africa way before the Egyptian times, and women played major roles uh, in everything. And here are Sumerian ladies. We've got different racial types. Um, we've got uh, good art, primitive art. And here we've got the tradition still surviving in China, southern China, where uh, they have their own language called Emi An, which is Sumerian, and where they've sort of kept the details of their history within the language and writing. And that's women, exclusively for women. 
And in this part of the world, the women choose who and when they sleep with a man. That's a very firm tradition. The message apparently is you take the man's hand and give him a little tickle here. And that means you're okay. Otherwise, a man has no right to impose himself on a woman at all. In India, um, you've got a situation where uh, women who run into debt have to pay ridiculous rates of interest and they have to work in the brickyards. That's how clever we are these days, the rotten lives they have. And this is when Shah Reza freed women from the veil. And there they are all dressed up in bowlers and top hats and trilbies and having an absolutely fantastic time. And that was the kind of liberated thought that we had in 1936 when Christian Abraham first went to uh, Iran. Now they put them in the backs of cars, the Taliban, and put a burqa over their heads. The veil they can't lift. That's, for some of you, look away at this point, but this is what's happening in Sudan. We're a girl, uh, because girls have no value. Um, I simply left the die. And the photographer who took was committed suicide the following year. He confided with friends that he wished he'd intervene and save the child. And I'd just like to say a word for the vulture. The vulture has got a kind of conscience in that the vulture wouldn't attempt to eat the child until the child had died. So we have to look at the animal world for common sense as well as the human world. And that signifies the kind of harmony we're looking for where um, if, you feed, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, but if you teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And here is a Chinese fisherman at dusk who got the lamp alight and his trained cormorants will be diving and picking up the fish and you know, fill that basket and he will have done a wonderful job to feed his local village great harmony and it's the same with our farmers and our country people with their uh, working terriers and their scent hounds we've all forgotten the really important jobs they do and now have made them illegal and now all we've got is unbelievable suffering because whether you shoot a fox, a deer or a hare there's no effective means whatsoever of following up a wounded animal or even looking for a wounded animal <coughs> or a sick animal or a diseased animal Hanifs and penitents are very important because Abraham was a, was a Hanif and they were the remnants, class, they believed to be, it's said here, the remnants of the priest class in the old role of society who carried down from father to son much of the specialist scientific knowledge. Now, neither Jesus nor Muhammad bought a new religion and both claimed to have met Enoch. This is very important to where we are in religion, how it's important it is for all of us whether we are Christians or um, whether we are Muslims, to actually understand our history and realize that we are all the same under the skin or wherever. We all believe in the same thing, and the sooner we get back to believing the same thing, the better. The following statements are supported by religious historians. Islam insists that neither Jesus nor Muhammad brought a new religion. Both sought to call people back to what might be called the Abrahamic faith. In contemporary records, both claim to have visited the planted highlands, Hashem in our heaven, and met Enoch. A grave is reserved beside Muhammad in Mecca for Jesus on his death after the prophecy of his second coming. So if Jesus comes back, he's got a grave already designated next to Muhammad. That tells you a lot about what's going on. These are quotations from the very earliest people in Egypt, 27th century BC, establishes the man whose standard is righteousness, who walketh according to its way. More acceptable is the virtue of the upright man than the ox of him that doeth iniquity. Righteousness is for eternity. It descendeth with him that doeth, in, doeth into the grave. His name is not effect faced on earth, but he is remembered because of right. A man's virtue is his monument, but forgotten is the man of evil repute. Now this is conscience, consciousness at very early dates, as you can see. We mustn't dismiss people who believe that painted savages existed before Jesus. And, and this is something near the end now, and this is such an important point. And this is Confucius again, and this is one of his students says to him, says, oh, you're really fed up with all the teaching. Why is it you stress the study and cultivation of virtue within the mind? There are those of us who say it is enough to lead a life of virtue and that such a life can be achieved without all the study you recommend. Ah, Ten Singh, the master replied, all of life is a matter of balance. If a person loves kindness but does not love study, their shortcomings will be ignorance. If a person loves wisdom but does not love sound ideas, their shortcomings will be having fanciful ideas. If a person loves honesty and does not study, their shortcomings will be the tendency to spoil or upset things. 
If a person loves simplicity but does not love study, their shortcoming will be the sheer following of routine. If a person loves courage and does not love study, his shortcomings will be unruliness or violence. If a person loves decision of character but does not love study, their shortcomings will be self-will or a headstrong belief in themselves. That's to me one of the most profound reasons for good education at all levels, particularly with politicians, scientists, priests who should have a holistic viewpoint and holistic education and like our Druids, at least 20 years of good training before they're allowed to spend our money. Um, summing up here, once upon a time in the civilized world, the monarch and the public servants who honored their oath of allegiance delivered to the people freedom, justice, leisure and instruction. By facilitating instruction and apprenticeship, the state encouraged each individual to develop special skills appropriate to the ascribed natural or genetic abilities of that individual to meet the many needs of the wider community. The pursuit of excellence in each department was a matter of honor, where self-interest led to a duty of care towards fellow citizens and the overall success of that community. And here we see that another May, another May second major catastrophe in 2354 ended the archaic Bronze Age civilization and all I've been talking about in the Golden Age. Summa as a political entity ceased to exist. Cometary debris, um, impact craters, here, here and here, all the evidence is stacking up now. It's just taking too long for people to realize how serious it is. Summarized there at a conference at Fruit William College in 1997, but it hasn't sunk in. All the various events, including the big event here, 2350. And I'm going to finish with Victor Clue, who is one of marvelous man who I've learned a lot from, who wrote two wonderful books, The Cosmic Winter and The Cosmic Serpent, with Bill Napier. And what we have here is his um, detailed description of what is happening out there and that we have at these various junctures, 3000 BC, 2240, um, all these dates are areas where we have major problems with cometary debris, dust, etc. We're heading for one right now. We have a much higher risk now than we've ever had before since 1200. Um, and it has to be taken into account when we're looking at our climate and climate change. And he, his conclusion of his paper is this. Whether or not mankind recognizes the approximately centennial threat is tantamount to choosing between apocalyptic and anti-apocalyptic outlooks on the environment. This question, as I've shown, is of deep historical and political significance, being intimately bound up with the origins of Christian doctrine and with the elitist desire to perpetuate anti-apocalyptic ism along with its appropriately distorted cosmological setting. In view of the intellectual and cultural climate of irrationality which arises thereby, it is a moot point whether mankind will meet the challenge posed by the, this question before the next bout of apocalyptic terror descends. Such a situation represents an intolerable risk to civilization. So there you have it all. We had it all. We lost it all. We need to understand it all in order to be able to get it back. So at the moment we're heading for six to nine billion people and massive extinction and loss in life and lots of starving people like that little girl in the Sudan, 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 in the Sudan.